Welcome to the August 3rd Thursday Web Forum. I'm Hillary Morris. I think most of y'all know me. I work on user support and communications for both the South Atlantic and the Southeast Conservation Blueprints. And we host this web forum every third Thursday of the month at 10 a.m. And it's intended to give folks like you a chance to uh, learn the latest updates with the blueprint, share your feedback, get involved, and to stay up to date on the latest developments in landscape conservation science in our region. So here's our usual agenda for the day. I'll start by introducing our speaker who will give us a 30 to 40 minute presentation or so on the monthly topic. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A and discussion at the end, especially with a fairly small group today. And then I'll wrap up by previewing next month's webinar. I'll go ahead and skip staff updates today um, just because Ro is going to cover everything that we want you to know in his talk. Uh, as a heads up, we are recording this webinar. I always do that just as a backup for folks who inevitably wanted to attend but had some sort of conflict. I will post the link to that recording and to the slides from the calendar event on the South Atlantic LCC website within a couple of days. So um, a couple of logistics. I'll just ask that you please keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. Uh, probably won't be an issue with the small group, but um, I can mute everybody if I have to. I just rather not. It makes it easier for us to interact in the Q&A. So any questions or comments before I move on to introducing Rua? Well, you all know Rua. Um, he's, he's the coordinator for both the South Atlantic and the Southeast Conservation Blueprints. He'll be wearing his South Atlantic hat today and talking to us about what is new with the latest version of the South Atlantic Blueprint version 2021, which was just released a couple of days ago. It is hot off the press. And I think most of you actually attended one of our Blueprint workshops. So um, this will be interesting for you all, hopefully, to see how we responded to your feedback and what's changed since those workshops back in May, June. So uh, Rua, with that, I will go ahead and hand things off to you to, to share and jump in with your part. Awesome. Thanks, Hillary. I need a literal South Atlantic hat. I think I have one close. <laughs> I'll bring it next time. Uh, yeah, so let's talk about all the fun stuff that's happened since the last Blueprint and even since the workshop. So I'll share my screen and let's talk about the new, come on, PowerPoint, you can do it. There we go. All right, so let's talk about the 2021 uh, Blueprint. So um, as of kind of what happened a little bit last year, you know, the broad patterns are similar um, in 2020, but the finer details are what we've been really working on and improving. So, you know, if you kind of step back and look, it's like, yeah, that looks very similar to uh, last year's blueprint, but we made a whole bunch of improvements and, and changes and tweaks, uh, including knocking off um, most of the known issues from last year, and uh, either making improvements or completely getting rid of them. Um, so we're, we're continuing to make some good progress. And so I'm gonna dive into just a few of them. I don't have time to talk about all the stuff we did, but I'll just dive into a few. So let's start with the marine improvements. Uh, so I'll talk about some major improvements and I'll just dive into a few of these here. Um, so we've got some improved slash updated indicators for marine mammals and then hard bottom and deep sea coral. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the Harbaugh and Deep Sea 401. We've got some new priority methods. So everything in state waters is in a high priority. That's some feedback we've gotten um, from, from folks wanting to use the blueprint in the nearshore marine environment. Um, and also we've got a new corridor approach focusing on moving through marine mammal areas and connecting estuaries. Um, so those are, those are some of the big ones. And I'm just going to talk about a few of those. Um, one is this hard bottom and deep sea coral, which used to be the potential hard bottom condition index. And the big thing we did with this one, if you look at the one on the left, uh, it was based on um, data from aggregated from CMAP, and it was really about known location. So where do we know their sort of hard bottom and, and deep sea corals and pieces like that? Uh, so the, the hotter colors are kind of higher priority in, in both of these pieces. Um, so before the indicator, we really had Okay, these are the known spots, but we didn't have a lot of like, well, what's suitable, but just we hadn't gone out and surveyed. And the data were relatively, you know, older for that. And we kept running into these known issues or places where people would go out and there'd be sort of new dives and new surveys and folks would find new stuff that wasn't coming out in the blueprint because um, it wasn't known at the time. It was fairly new. Uh, so this year we um, worked with folks from from TNC, folks from NOAA, and figured out the best way to combine kind of multiple approaches to looking at 
um, suitability for hard bottom and deep sea corals. And so this is this new indicator, which still captures the known areas, but also incorporates places that are suitable um, for coral or hard bottom. So places that maybe we haven't been, but are likely there. And we also refreshed based on the deep sea, some of the, the deep sea coral databases, uh, known locations as well uh, for this year. So we weren't missing the stuff that we already knew about. Uh, so that was a big refresh, give us a lot more visibility and less likely to miss stuff that is out there, but just hasn't been found yet in surveys. So that was cool. Uh, big method update this year uh, relates to marine ecoregions. So in the past, we sort of treated the marine environment as kind of all one giant blob out on the Atlantic side. And so we've done a couple of things um, related to that. One is that now the very near shore area is merged and run at the same time prioritization wise as the Atlantic coast. So that way, when you're looking at, say, a piece of salt marsh, it can incorporate the fact that there is marine birds nearby on the going into the ocean, but also it can incorporate inland what's going on in its migration space and where it's going. So the nearshore marine stuff um, is, is going up right against the, is included there. Then we split the marine environment to two um, marine ecoregions. And so this was another big part of responding to that everything's a priority in state water. So before, especially coming out of Georgia and some places, it was like, hey, everyone tells me everything off the Georgia state water is important. That doesn't help me guide my work because if everything's in a priority, then nothing's a priority. And so this kind of portfolio based approach uh, helps balance that out. And so you see in the new blueprint that there is um, a lot more helpful, hopefully, prioritization uh, that goes within state waters, within near shore uh, as well. So that that's cool. We still have some room for improvement in what happens right along the boundaries as things shift between them that we'll keep working on. Uh, but at least now, it's not like everything in state waters is a high priority. So that's a method update. It's fun to work on. And then another big thing is uh, some improvements in our marine corridors, uh, which we've been, um, which has been kind of requested quite a bit, uh, especially on the with folks looking at the ocean side of things. And so what you're looking at right now is is kind of our corridor mask that we're using this year um, that incorporates kind of estuaries and connections between them, but also um, movement zones from for different marine mammals. And so what this is, what we did was we took data from three, these three different species. So you can kind of see this is like, this is mostly a right whale movement zone up here. This is pretty much humpback whale. And this is sperm whale that comes up. They mix and match, especially off eastern North Carolina and those highly rich waters up there. Um, you know, and some humpbacks will go into the coast. But in general, um, these different movement zones are coming from the same data we use in our marine mammal index so those are giving us monthly abundance of all these different species and so what we did was we kind of looked at those monthly predictions of where each of these species was throughout the year and created these movement zones about places where like oh yeah these are going to be important places for for movement for each of these species um, and then we included all the estuaries and near shore because we know just about everything uses and hops between these different estuaries. Um, so this then was our kind of initial mask we use in thinking about the corridor. So they should be running between estuaries and they should be moving um, through as much blueprint as possible through these marine mammal movement zones as you get farther offshore. So these are the corridors um, that actually are in the blueprint now. Uh, under the corridor layers. And so this is them working their way from estuary to estuary and also through these different movement zones. Um, and so we can pull out, especially for user support and pieces, you know, which species movement zones are these um, particular areas coming out of. Yeah, so that is uh, some new stuff for the corridors themselves um, and incorporating the, the marine mammal movement zones. Those are those are some big ones for from a marine perspective. Um, since we got a small group, I'm going to stop and see if there's any questions right now on the marine stuff. And I'm going to go through freshwater and terrestrial, a few other things. Um, but is there any immediate questions you have jumping out 
at you about any of these um, marine improvements in the blueprint before I move on. This is Cindy. I have one question. Yeah. Um, in those marine environments, is there um, aquatic vegetation? So I don't know how much uh, like sargassum or um, other grass-like um, vegetation might be part of the smaller marine uh, habitat that might be important. I mean, I'm really not that familiar with North Carolina's further coastal, just the just the closer coastal, not that further coastal. Yeah, so there's a few. So on the aquatic vegetation side, we do actually in the estuaries now have oysters and submerged aquatic vegetation in this, like up in the Albemarle Pam. Um, and the prioritization. Uh, the biggest concentration from the, the Sargassum Sea component is like outside of this okay. U.S. waters. Um, but some of the aggregations of this, um, they do get driven by currents and kind of highly productive areas. And so where, where some of those, those kind of gyres and, and current intersections happen, um, those are, that's, so those intersections are also what's coming in our marine bird and our marine, particularly the marine birds, the marine mammals, yes, definitely. And the marine birds are even better at capturing some of those spots. Um, so, so a little bit of some of those aggregations, a lot of the biggest sargassum stuff is, is a little bit farther off coast, but there's still an important habitat um, even within the U.S. waters. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure about the far piece. I knew about the inland piece with the uh, SUVs and uh, some of the other aquatic vegetation out um, because that's when we get manatees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And some of the most interesting stuff, um, you know, as far as as quote unquote vegetation is sitting in the in the benthic habitats where there's a lot of really cool stuff um, in these highly productive areas. Um, and it, it's often kind of this intersection of um, you know, good conditions from currents and good geophysical conditions for where things can can latch on. Um, but it's amazing how rich and diverse some of these like really deep ocean areas are uh, with all kinds of cool <laughs> life down on the bottom. Um, I don't yeah, know. I think the oyster data that Rue was talking about is some new data from the Atlantic Coast Fish Habitat Partnership that we were pretty excited to get a hold of and incorporate this year. Um, Sorry, Rue, were you saying something? I was going to see if anyone else on the line had anything else to add on the, the sargassum thing. I think Gina's on there. If anyone else has anything else to add, or if I said something wrong, feel free to be like, Rue, you are totally wrong on that. <laughs> actually, that's fine, too. Rue, you are totally wrong. No, I'm just Thank kidding. You. <laughs> <laughs> I've been known to be wrong about things. I'm all good. No, I actually did have a question, though. So um, I found it interesting that for those three species of whales that you were showing that essentially it's a species specific corridor and are those the only three individual species that have like their own corridors in this map because i know most of them were based really more on habitat and, and known uses of habitats whereas this seems to be species specific and i was just curious whether these are the only ones or whether there are other uh, corridors that show up as as being driven primarily by a particular species yeah, so for this for our, for this year, it's these three species, um, which are fairly at least looking through the data. Some of the species, um, the data aren't really sufficient to create these kind of marine mammal movement zones in the way we did it. So they're actually like zones. <laughs> um, a number of other ones follow these corridors. So like this, you know, the humpback whale. This is the shelf break, right? And a lot of other species followed this same corridor as the right whale. So the right whale is kind of swallowing up a lot of species that that kind of hopscotch the coast. And then the sperm whale was capturing a lot of these species that go over the next like Blake Plateau and this edge species. So they were reasonable proxies for a number of other species that we couldn't uh, capture very well with the other components. But that's something I want to look into for next year is like, you know, bringing in some other species and seeing if there's some components. I think there's some nuance in this route in particular 
that um, there's at least a few species that that use but couldn't get the data to work in a way that would depict the movement zones. Um, so the intent wasn't just we only care about these three species. The intent was here are three indicator species where we have the data that can cover a number of movement routes, but they are not perfect in how well they do that. And I'll also add, you brought up, you know, the the way that the corridors historically have moved through more important habitats. And I would just clarify that I think that is that's still happening. Essentially, the way that we're using this marine mammal layer. Yeah, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to show. So these marine mammal movement areas we're essentially using as a mask. We're constraining our at least cross path analysis to having to go within these areas identified as marine mammal movement zones. But the exact route that the corridors are taking are still very much based on blueprint priority and all of the indicator values that those reflect. And so the specific path that a particular corridor is choosing in the least cost path analysis as its route is essentially to connect hubs over the shortest distance possible while moving through as much blueprint priority as possible. And that blueprint priority is reflecting all of our more habitat based indicators in the marine environment. Um, yeah. And we're defining the hubs as these large estuaries and then large patches of highest priority blueprint areas. So just wanted to clarify that that habitat condition and that kind of more holistic view of conservation priority is still very much a part of what's driving the corridors. We're just kind of constraining them with these movement zones. Yeah, so it's still going to work through the marine mammals. You know, those areas that are super important during certain choke points in their life cycle or just everything coming across all those marine mammals, it's still within that gray choosing the route that's going to benefit as many of them as possible. It's just all things being equal, run your way through these known kind of movement areas as it goes. Hi, right, thanks both. It, it would be great to get your feedback, though this is our first time running this approach. Um, if you have time to kind of dig into this or if you even have just a, a first blush, first impression of did these make sense to you as marine corridors, um, we would certainly welcome that feedback because this really is kind of our first time testing out this new approach. And we didn't have it ready in time for workshops. So because we were getting you know more holistic feedback on how we, pe people wanted the connectivity analysis to work. Yeah, yeah, definitely very open to other ideas, suggestions um, and something we're going to be working on improving for next year. All right. Any other questions about Marine before we move on to other stuff? Cool, if you make one, there's always time at the end too. Um, all right, so let's talk about the freshwater side of things. And so we improved, updated a bunch of indicators. Uh, we've got New more recent data from SARP on imperiled aquatic species. So we're looking at um, basically um, now it includes uh, species of greatest conservation need, all the kind of um, aquatic species of greatest conservation need refreshed from SARP. We've got another refresh we're going to do um, fairly soon for next year as well, but um, that's a lot more recent data on the imperiled aquatic species. Also refreshed our network complexity, looking at the sort of connection between different um, stream classes. We refreshed that based on the latest uh, Southeast Aquatic Resource Partnership, SARP, their latest connectivity data as well. So that's rerun, refreshed based on latest information on connectivity. And another one, which I'll talk about in a minute, is uh, an improvement of our migratory fish indicator on the Atlantic uh, to better capture Atlantic migratory fish habitat which I'll talk about that in a second. And then also we addressed an issue in the open water areas of Okefenokee, which was an issue in the last blueprint in the workshop. And so we've managed to fix that um, where we were the, some of these kind of open water areas in Okefenokee uh, that, that were looking a little too much like reservoirs ended up getting pulled out and didn't get, end up being priority in the blueprint when they should have. So that is all fixed now in this, this version as well. Let me talk about Atlantic migratory fish habitat. So this is another fun improvement we've we've made along the Atlantic. And so I'm going to show you kind of old 
indicator plus new indicator. This time we're zoomed in on Georgia as an example. I think this is a good one. Uh, so on the left is the indicator from last year. This is migratory fish connectivity. And it was really all about presence in those kind of um, sections of the, 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 the floodplain here. And so the red is the highest value, same, same with both of these. So pretty much if you had a Gulf for Atlantic sturgeon in your stretch, cool, you were high. If you had sh only shad, blueback herring, or striped bass, um, things were a little easier to get fish passage on, but still hard. Then you got the next level. And then if you were kind of just adjacent on the way up, then you get that next score. And so this is what it looked like a lot. Fairly simplistic, just like, can your migratory fish get there? <laughs> um, does it exist in that spot? And this year we updated to data from the Atlantic Coast Fish Habitat Partnership. So this syncs um, this indicator and the priorities uh, for migratory fish from the Atlantic Coast Fish Habitat Partnership. Um, so now it's now Atlantic Migratory Fish Habitat, which is a more detailed and holistic look at the migratory fish habitat. And so as you move over here, there's a lot more resolution into um, the kind of condition of the migratory fish habitat and that varies a lot more as you're going along the along the way so this one has kind of got a, a, a scoring system up to eight but you do have bins of kind of okay these particular areas are like excellent migratory fish habitat these are restoration opportunity areas and and the and others are just not such good restoration opportunity areas for migratory fish. Um, so this this gives us a lot more. Not only does it sync it up with the like, Fish Habitat Partnership, which is also great, um, but it also gives us a little bit more detail on the importance of spots and goes a little bit farther into historic range and other habitats that are important for migratory fish that we weren't capturing. And also filled in a gap we had in um, and sturgeon habitat as well. There were some spots we were missing. We weren't going kind of far enough. It's a good example right here, which now comes in over here. So there was some migratory fish habitat we were missing in that indicator. So we're able to knock out that known issue and also improve the Atlantic coast habitat. We have found the equivalent on the Gulf. So it's still fairly simple on the Gulf side, but on the Atlantic side, that was a nice um, improvement we were, able, we were able to make for, for this year. And yeah, so that's it for fresh water. I will stop again, see if there's any questions about the water improvements we made this year. Or just a few of the, some of them. <laughs> and feel free just to hop off mute or type into the chat if you prefer. Hi, I'm a new guest, and I have a question about uh, the Okefenokee in particular, well, and all the fish habitat. Mm -hmm. Does the Georgia Department of Natural Resources have all your data so they can use it to make their decision about whether titanium may be mined next to the Okefenokee? Yeah, we have um, some folks involved in the blueprint and a larger strategy, um, Di Ambrose and other folks um, and and refuge managers and stuff like that. So they have they have the data on from the blueprint and we work with them in a number of different ways within within Georgia. Um, and actually the uh, the earlier discussion about the marine section. Um, and how there's too much priority in the state waters actually came from some of the folks from Georgia DNR <laughs> who were working on um, kind of near shore marine stuff. And they're like, I want to use the blueprint, but everything's a priority <laughs> on the near shore. Um, so we are, uh, but I would also say that I think there's also some room for improvement on how well that's integrated across all the different folks in, in Georgia DNR. So we're still working on those um, those connections, but we do have a number of blueprint uses by Georgia DNR folks on the coast, um, inland, and hopefully in the near future on the marine environment as well. Yes, and I've heard quite a bit from some of the folks in Okefenokee about that titanium mine, and um, we talked a little bit about how the blueprint might be helpful in some of that discussion. Thanks, Stephanie. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Right, we will move on to the terrestrial side of things. 
Um, so I'll highlight a few major improvements on the terrestrial side. And um, so a number of, again, improved updated indicators, uh, equitable access to potential parks, uh, made some significant, that's a new indicator. Um, we split our urban open space into two indicators this year. One now is urban park size and another one is equitable access to potential parks. So current parks and potential future ones get, get split up here and made some significant improvements to equitable access um, after after the uh, the workshop. And so now it is focused um, very strongly on kind of some of the more socially vulnerable populations that don't have nearby access to parks. Um, and that's gonna continue to improve over time. Um, I probably could have mentioned this one too, but I don't have more details on, on this one. You'll hear about more details on that soon. Um, and yeah, a new indicator for Piedmont Prairie, which we also improved post-workshop based on feedback. A new indicator, um, well, an improved indicator for looking at fire frequency. And uh, last web forum, I talked about how we're using that and gave some examples of some private lands and some good quality longleaf habitat that are coming out in the blueprint that were missed um, before. So I'm not going to go back into that one since we did that last time. Uh, some improvements to the resilient sites, which I'm going to talk about um, as a from a sea level rise adaptation perspective and also a new shoreline condition indicator that looks at the shoreline more holistically. It was one of the comments in the past, we had sort of a beach alteration indicator and people were really interested in the more broader going into the estuaries across the entire coast approach to um, looking at shoreline condition and living shorelines. And so that's also improved. And um, one of the big methods improvements is that the corridors on land now go through broad areas of established conservation interest for connectivity and can incorporate road crossings, which is super exciting. Um, and I almost went into this for, for this talk, but Amy, our GIS coordinator, who's done a lot of work on this, is going to be doing a blog post in the newsletter, her part two of the, the blog that Hillary did on the corridors, talking all about the the, the terrestrial corridor approach and hybrid approach. So I do not want to steal her thunder on the really cool details about uh, the new corridor approach and the blueprint. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, um, other than we were basically this, this is the hybrid approach that folks wanted coming out of the workshop. Um, and then also road crossings, yay. Um, okay, so we talk about the resilient sites changes we made this year. So these are, um, and so on the left, this was kind of resilient sites. I intentionally picked North Carolina because this shows this issue in particular starkness. Uh, so we've used the terrestrial resilient sites for a long time. You know, where are these important areas that are important for biodiversity, um, both now and into the future with climate change. Um, so those stop at a certain point once you start getting to sea level rise zones. And then working with um, Mark and Annalie in that group, uh, we've got the coastal sites, which look at salt marsh complexes and their ability to move inland into the future and their ability to support biodiversity. Uh, but there was a gap, you know, in last year between those two, because we had sort of the uplands that were less likely to get impacted by sea level rise soon. And then we had the current salt marsh complexes and they're a bit there. How were they? How resilient were they? But the migration space in between was something we were missing last year. So this is this blank area in between is what we didn't have incorporated. So this year we combined the terrestrial and coastal resilient sites, again, working with folks at TNC, make sure we're doing it in the, in the, in the right way, and uh, added the resilience of the marsh migration space in between. So now again, hotter colors, more resilient, cooler colors, less resilient. And so now we have the full suite of not just where the salt marshes are, but where's the resilient migration space that they're going to need to move into the future, and then linking that up to the areas that are less likely to be impacted by um, sea level rise, but will also be important with climate change into the future. So we now have this merged area, and that's already helped improve um, how well the blueprint captures a few um, kind of inland migration zones for, for sea level rise. We had a couple, we did pretty good on most of them, but there were a few in Georgia um, and in North Carolina where we weren't doing a good job capturing the important kind of migration paths for coastal ecosystems to move inland. Um, and so uh, this definitely helped a lot for this year. And yeah, so that is the 
terrestrial, that's just an example of one of the, the terrestrial improvements we made this year. And I can't go into, there's just so much cool stuff to talk about. Um, but if you really want to know some of the gory details and, and the things we've made, there's more details in the change log. Um, Hillary linked to it in her blog post. When you download the blueprint, this, this comes along with it, in addition to the development process for all the gory details of how we put stuff together. Um, you don't have to read all the, the, the details of this, but I wanted to show you this, this chart, um, mostly to highlight that um, this, the only, every one of these, so there's a little kind of change thing. This is, these are indicators that have changed between blueprints and then the pluses and minuses are things that were removed and replaced by something else, you know, similar, but, you know, something else to capture those things. And the point I wanted to make with this is that of all the different indicators and all the changes, there are only like four that we didn't touch this year and improve in some smaller big way. The forest or wetland extent, marsh extent, greenways and trails, amphibian and reptile areas. But there was a lot of change improvements we made uh, to these different indicators, either kind of new significantly improved ones or small improvements um, based on your feedback that we made to stuff. So uh, if you want to see all the details of what's changed, that's all written up in the change log, um, which we've been doing now uh, based on requests from folks on talks like this when we give a seminar. It's like, oh, do you have some summary of all the changes? Yes, we do now. Um, and Hillary put a lot of work into this piece trying to get this all together in our blueprint timelines. That's major, more details in the change log if you want to see that. Um, I'll stop again for terrestrial changes. Questions on terrestrial changes. Hey, Rua, this is Cindy. Yeah. Um, I got dumped out, so maybe you, you covered some of this now that I'm back in. With shoreline condition, were you able to incorporate any information from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, sand allocation reports that they do where they've um, actually looked at places where sand can be dredged in places where sand should be uh, deposited? That is, we weren't able to do it this year. That is on our, our wish list for next year's update. Um, right now, it's it's basically using the, the NOAA data on shoreline conditions, sort of, you know, are you hardened, partially hardened, natural shoreline condition. Um, and it did work a lot with folks in the Army Corps on getting blueprint data and for a number of indicators um, into some of those assessments. Um, but yeah, the sand allocation is, is we weren't able to get it this year, but it's it's high up on the list for incorporating into um, next blueprint. And does any of that shoreline condition uh, take into consideration when sand or some sort of grooming maintenance it happens? Because we know that that covers forage for the shorebirds you know if it gets compacted and then if you know all the little creatures that wash up that they're always chasing after you know if you've got new sand out there a lot of that stuff gets uh, buried mm -hmm. yeah it's that's the, the the data seemed to be there and that was one that was another piece um of the that we almost got in this year <laughs> Um, because it's, I think, like like you have, you've got like, what's the condition? And that tells you about that beach condition. Uh, the other thing we we're looking at um, that we started working on is improving the beach birds indicator itself um, to capture not just the beach uh, nourishment component of things, because we were talking about uh, beach birds, but also um, the human disturbance aspect. You know the, the the traffic of people and how how that has an impact too. So I think those are those are two things we were looking at for improving um, on the the beach bird component. Both the you know what the renourishment is looking like, but also just what's that people pressure um, that has such a huge impact on them from a disturbance perspective. 
this is the thing like with with some of these it's it's so hard to cut yourself off every year <laughs> and what you move to next year because it's like ah oh. but we are really close on that part on scoping um some of the beach pieces so i think we'll be in good shape for next year for that one interesting comment um in the chat from michael that he's seen that it takes three plus years for beach mana to return to normal after a beach replenishment project. That's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is definitely huge. And now there's some good, I think there's data on both of those sides of disturbance, right? You know, the, the, the renourishment cycle and also the human disturbance cycle. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're key parts of that condition. It was, I'm glad y'all brought this up. That'll be helpful for prioritizing this for next year. The, yep. the NOAA data that we're using is the Environmental Sensitivity Index that kind of looks at shoreline condition from the perspective of oil spill vulnerability. So kind of has it been developed? Is there human infrastructure there? Is it natural and intact? Um, so I, I'm not sure that that's how well that's incorporating beach renourishment. So we might be needing to bring that in kind of from some other data sources, so like several that y'all have suggested. Yeah, that's what we were scoping, but didn't didn't get to. But yeah, like Hillary said, I mean, literally when we sit down and we go through and we have our tick list of stuff, it's just about like, oh yeah, that came out in the workshop and we did the web forum. We had two folks emphasizing the importance of that. It's like, oh yeah, well then we're gonna that's gonna be a higher priority. <laughs> you know, here y'all y'all carry more weight than we do. We have our pet uh, indicators we all want to improve, but you know, they they uh they take second you know <laughs> seat to the stuff that that y'all call out anyone else have questions on the terrestrial side before rua wraps up here rolling into so a couple things on um we had made some other overall methods improvements. Um, one of them is related to improved upland versus wetland balance. I think this is always the sort of challenge you have in, in um, balancing out the priorities, making sure there's sufficient um, priorities to capture all the different important ecosystems and, and species of this diverse area. And so one of the things we had last year is we pushed a little bit too far into the everything, the floodplain is a priority wet um, side of things. And so we worked on some improvements of our methods, the indicator weighting in particular, um, that's uh, to help balance things out in a more transparent and consistent way that's kind of more rule set based. And so there is an improved balance. There's a little more upland in this particular version of the blueprint. And there's also um, more, as a result of that, there's also more corridors that uh, go, that are overland connections that connect river basins. Um, so that was one of the ways that also manifests all the way down to the corridors is that if you have almost all, too much of your priority in just the floodplains, then all your corridors run down the the floodplains as well. And so that was something that's come out in multiple times in, in groups that we didn't have enough overland connections and, and some issues with upland priority. So we've improved that balance. That's something I'm sure for all of attorney, we're going to keep working on and how you kind of maintain all those components. But there's some improved balance in this one, which is cool. And the other thing related to methods that we've been working on really hard is more scalable methods and indicators. So we're, we've been switching over as much as possible to things we can do over really big areas um, because in 2022, um, the, the methods and indicators and stuff we were talking about were going to be expanding to cover at least that entire green area that you see there um in that center so you know 12 states plus the atlantic ocean side of things uh it may be more we'll see how things evolve in 2022 um there is significant interest in the indicators the methods we've been doing in the south atlantic blueprint uh not just in the southeast but also now in the midwest and in the northeast and also some places out west so I've been working with folks um, on some potential path where we might be able to use the same methods, the same indicators, which cover much bigger areas than just the South Atlantic. Um, and pretty much, you know, 
you know, maybe there's a path, who knows, where you're seeing similar methods and similar stuff across the entire east and parts of the west uh, in the future. Um, so we'll we'll see how all that that comes around. But the one thing is, at a minimum next year, we're doing this, we're calling this sort of the base blueprint um, approach where we're covering at least those 12 green states uh, with those consistent metrics and indicators and stuff like that. And so that's going to be a big thing. And this year, we've been really basically planning and working on things so we can scale and we can do this at a much bigger area. And yeah, so that was also overall methods improvements, stuff that can scale, stuff that can do so. Um, you know, folks in various states or various ecological regions, um, you know, you're able to do stuff across boundaries um, and have kind of a shared set of metrics and approaches across a much bigger area. Uh, yeah, so those are some major improvements. And then there's still a number of known issues. I think there always will be known issues as we keep working on stuff, um, which is, I think, a good sign that we've got a lot of people looking. It's helpful having, you know, the hundreds of people over the um, workshops and their eagle eyes looking at things really helps us identify what to work on. I just called out a few of the known issues and there's a full list up on the blueprint page refresh now um there's some we're still working on the albar pamlico the open water estuary and some spots especially up in the curatuck and the northern part and fixing some prioritization uh, it's better than in the past but still needs work the near shore and estuarine priorities on the gulf of mexico need lots of work there's only one indicator there around coastal condition and so that's needs lots of work um and the far east part of the marine area is still under prioritized and it's mostly just due to lack of survey data for the models i mean we try to model stuff as much as possible um you know in all of our indicators but we just know so little on the far eastern part of the marine area that i expect as we get more data and surveys and those get worked into the the, the models for for birds and and mammals and things we'll get a better sense of um what's going on farther east uh, fresh water there's still some areas with imperiled aquatics that are under prioritized. Um, we capture the very specific basins and parts of rivers that are under prioritized based on um, some really great review from folks. And so those are the ones we're looking most closely at when we try to make sure we're refreshing the, the data and, and, and addressing those issues with methods and, and newer data. And on the terrestrial side, a couple things. Uh, some of the large upland areas fragmented by dirt roads. Uh, we made some fixes after the workshop, so a lot of the national forests and things are coming out much stronger than they were before, but there's still some improvements we need to do related to the, the sort of those upland areas with lots of dirt roads. Um, there's some ways we think we can fix it through the indicators, and so we'll see what we can do next year. And still working on some of the inland working lands in Florida that are important for sea level rise. Um, those are tricky ones. We made some improvements based on comments from last year. We're no longer just picking out the wetlands. We're doing more kind of wetland upland combinations, but it's still not quite working as well as it should. So we're um, that's another known issue to work on for next year. So yeah, I know it's a shocker. It's still not perfect, um, but we're going to keep working on it and it keeps getting better over time. With that, I got any other closing questions? And we definitely have time for a few more. I don't have a question, but I would like to just say thank you for all of your work. You've done um, an immense job and provided a, a great resource for us. So thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah. Yeah, Ruth, this Gino, um, kudos to, to your team there. Um, you know, as you know, I've been watching this from from the beginning, and um, it's just great to see it develop and mature and and get finer and finer in its its detail and addressing uh, indicators and other issues. Um, what's the plan for the Gulf Coast? What is there a, a an approach for gathering the information you need? I'm sure there is. I see I see Hillary nodding. Yeah, so we're we're um, I've been talking with with Christina and the folks from Gulf of Mexico Alliance. And um, so I think there's a, a path for next year for the immediate near shore area um, with some equivalence in building out what we might do. And then um, I think working through the Gulf of Mexico Alliance and through the kind of partnerships there, I think there's probably a path in 2020, 
23 to have the entire Gulf Marine area included in the blueprint um, and also the Caribbean. Those are two paths that we're, we know we can't take on with the big expansion we're doing next year, next year, but we wanna try to set the stage for it by working on indicators in that small nearshore area, but always thinking about the bigger full Gulf and full Caribbean area, because um, eventually we want full coverage across that, that section. So we'll is start. The, we're starting on indicators. Is included at all at this point? Uh, what did you say, Gina? Is the Caribbean included at all at this point? The um, watersheds within, um, well, not in the South Atlantic blueprint. In the larger Southeast blueprint, we have um, kind of a watershed, like a 12 watershed prioritization um, that covers the land part of, of Puerto Rico. Um, and but I think there, our plan in 2023 is to basically do land and waters of Puerto Rico and then also hopefully the Virgin Islands. I've been talking with some of the state folks in the Virgin Islands and, and some of those and there's real interest in in that piece as well. So um, right now in the bigger southeast blueprint, there is Puerto Rico. Um, and hopefully in 2023, we can do that push where we've got Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, surrounding waters, Gulf and Atlantic. So that's what we're trying to stage to. But as as always, you know, as we're working through folks, if we're working through GOMA and folks are, you know, the partnership and folks are like, no, don't do the Gulf stuff. <laughs> don't go that far onto the Gulf Ocean. Then we won't go out in the Gulf Ocean. If the folks from like, you know, state agency and for, uh, the Virgin Islands then get less excited about it when they review or see things we're not quite ready yet, then it's like, okay, we, we hold off until it's, um, ready enough, but I think the the plan right now we're shooting for building the foundation, data sets, components, relationships to do um, Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, and the the full Gulf, and are trying to kind of work within the partnerships now around the data so we're ready. Very good, thank you. Yeah, it'll be an exciting new frontier. <laughs> <laughs> That current plan that we use in Puerto Rico is kind of a legacy prioritization from a Caribbean Landscape Conservation Cooperative that they did kind of an expert-driven HAC 12 level prioritization, almost kind of in the style of South Atlantic Blueprint 1, if you can think back that far. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a little bit it's a little bit coarse and due for a refresh. So we're very excited to dig into that. Um, yeah. Hopefully in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. Another reason why we're holding off for the expansion part for some of these farther flung areas has been, you know, some of the data sets we use as sort of our base components aren't always available in some of those places, like in the Virgin Islands, there's like some different land cover, different, you know, some of the data we use. So it's a little easier to start scaling with what we have and then start planning for like over a longer horizon to get to like the newer stuff. Um, so we're running into that. You run into that in yeah, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, Gulf um, to a lesser degree. And then we're working with folks in Alaska and other spots out West that also don't have equivalent data, but are interested in using as consistent as possible methods and pieces. So they're another thing where it's just like, oh yeah, most of what we we do here for our indicators doesn't exist in Alaska. <laughs> um, but but yeah, I think that's super important places and there's there's, good opportunities there and, and a lot of interest. So I, I feel like it's- Yeah, I thought that the Office for Coastal Management had updated the land cover um, data for both Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. Oh yeah, there's good different. land cover there. It's yeah. just different. I mean, from an economy of scale, I, I'm confident we could do what we're doing. We may have to, again, use a slightly different land cover or a slightly different set of some indicators, but I'm confident that we can use the blueprint approaches and methods we've developed and honed um, and a number of the indicators um, in, in the Virgin Islands and, and uh, Puerto Rico. I mean, to some, sometimes there's better. I mean, there's finer resolution stuff um, and there's better stuff than we have in, uh, in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, too. So it, it, it's, uh, it's not just uh, different or not as good. Sometimes it's better and that's a nice opportunity to do something we can't quite do yet on the mainland. Yeah. All right, very good. Well, if I can help identify people or anything um, out there, let me know. Awesome. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great.
Yeah, along with the big push for data and planning is going to be a big push for review and convening partners. And so um, I'm sure we'll be we'll be relying heavily on our net networks and the people who have supported us this far to help us continue to reach out um, and broaden the involvement in the review. So thanks for that. I'm sure we'll take you up on that one the time. Oh, comes. yeah, All right. definitely. <laughs> awesome. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. We might have time for one more question if someone wants to sneak one in, and then I want to show you all what's on deck for next month because it's going to be a good talk. All right, well, I'll go ahead and give a preview of next month's presentation and then pause at the end again for questions. Um, so next month, we're going to be co-hosting the third Thursday Web Forum with the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, which is something we did um, over the summer last year. So um, because of that, we will be using a different connection than this Teams call that we usually use. It's going to be hosted via Zoom. And I'm going, if I can multitask, I'm going to drop the, the link to that Zoom into the chat. Don't know, sometimes it turns things a very strange color and I don't know why it's yellow, but um, <laughs> Follow that link to get to the Zoom um, for next month's web forum. You can pre-register, uh, but you're not required to. If you want to go ahead and sign up and get it on your calendar, I definitely encourage you to. If you just want to go back to that link um, on the 16th of September, right at 10 a.m., if and you just register, it'll drop you directly into the meeting. So you don't have to pre-register if you don't want to. But essentially, um, we're going to be hearing from Michelle Mormon with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She is a biologist in the Refuge Inventory and Monitoring Program. And she's going to be talking about coastal wetlands transformation in the South Atlantic Basin. I think this is really relevant to a lot of the salt marsh migration stuff that Rua was touching on when we were talking about this blueprint improvements and how it handles resilience. You know, we all know Coastal wetlands, our marshes are super important ecologically. They're threatened by both sea level rise and by wetland subsidence and sometimes both. And so recognizing that a lot of the National Wildlife Refuge system is in the coastal plain and very much under threat. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service started a coastal wetlands elevation monitoring program that's been doing surface elevation table monitoring um, across various refuges. and um, They've been determining rates of wetland elevation change, comparing them to sea level rise estimates, and basically determining across various wetland types, oligohaline marshes, salt marshes, forest of wetlands, and pocosins, which ones are likely to keep up which, with sea level rise, which ones are likely to experience um, some sort of ecological transformation that managers of public lands across the coastal plain are going to need to be prepared for. So she's going to be presenting essentially the body of work that they've been doing through this monitoring program since 2012. They're starting to really get some some great findings and long term data from this study. So I think that's going to be super exciting. And then um, looking one month further ahead to October, I wanted to touch on we should be hearing from uh, from Matt Pody with NOAA on their new deep water coral and hard bottom project that they have underway. So just thinking about further improvements to, to next year's blueprint, hopefully building on a lot of what Rua talked about in the marine environment, that's going to be a really great talk. Um, so that's what's on deck for next month. And then uh, I always like to end on this slide, how to get involved in the blueprint. Um, join our newsletter at southatlanticlcc.org or South southeast.org for the larger CCAST newsletter. Um, it's a great way to stay up to date about the latest developments with the blueprint and it will get you a reminder about this web forum. And I also encourage you to explore the conservation blueprint online at the South Atlantic scale, at the Southeast scale, especially this latest version of the blueprint and all of the improvements that Rua just covered. We'd love to know what you think and how it's working for you. And if you'd like to use the blueprint in your work to inform a conservation decision, to strengthen a grant, User support staff are here to help you. That's what, um, that's what I do, what my colleague Louise does and um, our ever-growing team as well. So we'd love to talk to you more about how the Blueprint could be of use and get your feedback. So with that, I will, I will cut off our web forum today, 10.58, two minutes for questions if somebody uh, has another question that's occurred to them before we leave. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope you will join us again in September to hear from Michelle. Um, have a great rest of your week.